hello. Um, I, I'm in Mount Street Gardens, um, so please do excuse me if we're interrupted by um, uh, wandering shoppers or priests nipping across the road for a cohiba. But um, my flat is um, too dark at the minute. I'm going to be reading from Pulling Princes, which is book one in my uh, Mallory Towers uh, esque series, uh, set in St. Augustine's and Eads, uh, which I think we all know uh, now is based on um, my daughter's school and Eton, and uh, inspired by my sons and daughters experience at uh, boarding school and my own experiences with little uh, nuns all of them under four foot nine um, really cute Flemish um, and they had just these everything about them was just so adorable I can't bear it but anyway this is chapter one book one and it's titled St Augustine's Life at St Augustine's had been hell since day one, which was why I'd made a decision that I would do everything I could to get the cool crowd to accept, if not respect me. I mean, okay, so I suppose I knew deep down they were shallow and mean, but, well, there's only so long you can spend as the form freak before you actually go mad and start wanting to be part of the cool set that's making your life hell. I knew I had a tough term ahead of me if I was going to finally start fitting in. I knew I was going to have to totally reinvent myself. That is, become the sort of girls who can, girl who can pull boys, particularly really fat ones, from Eton. So it was halted. I was on the case. I knew radical action was needed, but that was cool too. I had a radical plan. I'd even factored in the possibility of things getting worse before they got better. In short, I was prepared. But even I, the queen of the doomsday prophecies, my mother's nickname for me, what can I say, she's hilarious, hadn't considered the possibility that I would be forced to share a dorm room with the Honourable Georgina Castle Orpington. The girls, all dressed in the hideously evil St Augustine's uniform, maroon printed skirt and green ruffled shirt, were all crowded with their toff parents, toff valets and even their toff security in tow. In the dimly lit, wood panelled entrance hall, peering at the notice board to find out which dorm they're in and whom they'd be sharing a dorm room with that term. Oh, brilliant. I'm with the American freak, I heard Georgina whisper sarcastically to the not so honourable Honey O'Hare, a member of her cool pod of friends. That's what they call me, American freak. They do these horrendously bad piss takes of my accent, which is ironic, really, because when I go back to Los Angeles during the holidays, everyone starts talking like Dick Van Dyke about me, imitating what they perceive to be my proper English accent. You can't win, really. Standing at the back of the crowd, waiting for my chance to see the list, I pretended not to have heard Georgina's lament and think of something really cutting to say in reply. I rarely actually say the cutting things that I think up in my head because I've discovered it's better to stay under the radar and keep my witty remarks to myself if I'm to survive in this boarding school. Both Georgina and Honey were holding their Louis Vuitton pet carrier bags containing matching super cute pet rabbits, arabesque and Claudine. They'd have hated it if they'd known, but I was always stopping by the pet shed to s secretly cuddle their rabbits particularly Georgina's arabesque, who was so adorable and had the sweetest pink eyes and softest, floppiest ears. Honey's toffee-coloured ra co rabbit Cordine was always nipping me. No surprises there. I would have loved rabbits of my own, but one of the things about being an American freak at an English boarding school is that you don't get to have a pet because of the totally cruel quarantine laws. My parents probably saw this as character building, like everything else that depresses me. My parents are very big on character. Both my parents are writers in Hollywood. I long to write myself, only not the sort of dreary stuff they write. They think of themselves as really hip and liberal because they say I can call them Sarah and Bob, like I'd ever do that. Besides, they're so not cool. For a start, they drive a Volvo and say things like swell, my father, and super, my mother. 
My mother is a senior staff writer on a crappy soap that doesn't even air in the UK, so no kudos there. My father's writing the big one. Sorry, he always uses uh, inverted commas to announce that. Which is Hollywood speak for the script that will finally make a name for him, but currently brings in no money. They didn't think LA was the place to bring up a teenager. They told all their friends that they're afraid I'd become too Hollywood. They sent me to um, a French school when I was very small, which is where I picked up my fencing problem. But the real reason I was in this hell was because my mother's British. Well, my mother is British, and she went to St Augustine's, and she adored it. It'll be super, darling. You'll make friends for life. Just wait and see, she promised me on the flight over here three years ago. All I'd come up with in the friendship department so far was star. Admittedly, she is pretty super. She's the daughter of a rock star who was huge in the 80s, and even though he was mega and still adored by several million tragic people with bad hair worldwide and is one of the richest men in Britain, star was too random and unconventional to be accepted at St Augustine's or to have any kudos like Antoinette did. Antoinette's entire family are pop stars. Even though Antoinette was in the year below us, she was considered the trendiest girl in school, unlike Star, who was total, a total goth with a lot of, well, even to me, very weird habits. One, wearing only black. Two, fencing. Well, I fence too, but I am the American freak. Three, having freaky extend, a freaky extended family. And four, being friends with me. Honey pointed one of her long French manicured fingers at the list and said, Oh, yeah, but darling, look, it's not just the American freak. Guess who else you'll be room I've you've been roomed with? Only her weird friend, Star. Georgina's eyes almost popped out of their long-lashed sockets. Darling, are you serious? I'm so going to get Daddy to complain, she declared loudly as she looked despairingly down the list and held her own perfectly manicured head to her hand to her brow. Honestly, I thought, it's a wonder these two don't wear tiaras. Whoops, they do on occasion. This was going to be a, a great term. My despair at having to share a room with Georgina was somewhat diluted by the thought of Star being in my room too. I'd asked to share with Star, but as Georgina knew, you don't always get your, to share with your first choice. Star's my best friend, as I said earlier. She was my only friend, in fact, on account of us both being the form freaks. We'd bonded the first day of Year 7, my first year at St Augustine's, in fencing. We spent so many hours alone together in the Sald Arms practicing, i.e. escaping from the other girls, and in Star's case, fancying Professor Sullivan, our fencing master, that we grew pretty close, especially when we both chose Sabre as our weapon. The other girls were beginners, so had to start on the foil, but because Star and I had been fencing since we were quite young and were showing so much enthusiasm, Professor Sullivan had allowed us to advance to Epe and finally on to Sabre. Sabre is the most aggressive of the three fencing weapons, yay. It has a really cool full fist guard and a flat cutting blade with a folded off end rather than the tragic looking bobble that you have on foil. Can't injure anyone with a bobble. Sabres have a bit of a reputation. Sabers, sorry, have a bit of a reputation for being swashbuckling and ruthless. A swashbuckling and ruthless lot. In our ignorance, Star and I thought ruthlessness and swashbuckling would be agonisingly chic qualities to foster. But that was before we realised that being sabers would make us stand out. Something that wasn't done at St Augustine's. Things that made girls stand out and therefore make them the object of ridicule and derision at St Augustine's School for Ladies. One, not being willowy and having really, really long hair, preferably blonde. Two, not having a title or at least a double-barreled name, although using your title was considered super tragic. Three, not owning a massive house in the country and a quite big one like it in a really smart area of London. Four, having a spot problem, i.e. any spots whatsoever. Five, being overweight, i.e. being of average or above average weight for your height. Note well, even bulimia and anorexia were more status-enhancing than being a chubber at St Augustine's. Six, having unusual amounts of body hair, i.e. any. Seven, having a funny accent, i.e. any accent that wasn't madly posh and English. 
A, not being asked to be a debutante, i.e. being presented to the Royal Court. Perversely, actually agreeing to be a debutante marked you out as even more uncool than if you hadn't been asked in the first place. Nine, not being attractive enough to pull fit boys, preferably older ones, who then went on to leave messages on your mobile for other girls to listen to. Ten, not being completely obsessive about sweets and fags. Eleven, having clothes that no one else would buy, i.e. non-designer like mine. Number nine was the clincher though, not being attractive enough to pull fit boys, preferably older ones, who then went on to leave messages on your mobile for other girls to listen to because pulling fit older boys is vital for all girls, but especially for girls who live in an all-girls school where the ability to pull fit boys confers status like nothing else can. Uh, I'll read more later perhaps, or I'll go on to another book, but the Louboutins are starting to head this way um, again. So I, oh, and here comes a couple of priests, uh, on the hunt for Cohibas, so I must ash. Laters.